Yeah, good afternoon. And first of all, I would like to thank Professor Fischer for inviting me. When I walked in into the college, I saw the statue of Claude Bernard, and of course, I am, everybody must feel humbled by the series of great scientists that uh, were associated with this institution. So I would like to do my best to show you what we are trying to do in my uh, laboratory in Freiburg. And I uh, discuss design principles of adaptive immune systems. And the reason why we are interested in design principles is that, of course, when you consider the uh, diversity of animals that inhabit this planet, you will realize that even amongst vertebrates, to which we belong, there are about 60 or more thousand different types of species. And it's, it, it, it is clear that because they inhabit different uh, 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 ecological niches, that they must have adapted to their various habitats. And that almost certainly also is reflected in the organization and function of their immune systems. So by looking at these different types of species and comparing their, the structure of the immune system and the function of the immune system, we thought it would be uh, possible to derive some general principles by which adaptive immune systems are organized. And I've grouped these vertebrates here into two major uh, groups. One very small group, that is the group of extant jawless vertebrates. All the others, more than 60,000, belong to jawed vertebrates. And the jawless vertebrates are thought to have, a, have arisen during about 500, 550 million years ago. But they have been shown recently, and I'll come to this a bit later in the talk, also to possess an adaptive immune system. And we know about the adaptive immune system, of course, in jawed vertebrates, in mammals. You heard a lot now uh, from Professor Fischer about the organization of lymphocyte development and even thymus development. So there is a lot of commonalities in jawed vertebrates, but there is surprising commonalities now also with the jawless vertebrates, indicating that at a time of about 500 million years ago, when vertebrates emerged, there must have been a major reorganization of immune defenses from innate immunity to adaptive immunity. And we are interested, as I said, in the general principles by which these adaptive immune systems are organized. So how can one derive general principles. Of course, this is a very simple concept, a very simple idea. You simply compare two species, two clades, or two groups of animals, and look at what they have in common. So that commonality can be at the level of genes. It can be at the level of... Okay. It can be at the level of... Maybe on. Ah, here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it can be it can be at the level of genes. It can be the, at the level of cells. It can be at the level of organs. And we tend to go. Or we be, we tend to begin at the level of organs, then work our way, way backward to cells, and then to genes, and then all the way back to organs, because of course organs are much easier to observe, particularly for these different types of species. Then you can use histology to look at, at cells. And then with the modern uh, technologies, you can also look at genes and genomes. But then you have a plethora of information and you have to somehow organize it and arrive at this overlap here, if you wish. And then the question is, is this overlap that we are extracting from our comparative analysis, is that really functionally meaningful? So the, the test to do this is to go backwards to ask if we are right in our conclusion, then perhaps one or the other gene, when used to build an artificial system, should do what we expect it to do. And of course, these multiple comparisons have a number of problems when you compare different types of species. We do not have the genomes of all species, clearly. In some species, it is, it is not possible to carry out genetic uh, tests. So there is a scarcity of resources and tools. We, don't, we cannot identify cells, perhaps merely only by histology. We don't have these 
uh, diversified techniques that we can use in mammals, in mice and humans, where we have antibodies against cell surface structures. For many species, that doesn't exist. However, one has to realize, and I think that is particularly important for, for the, the human situation, there is a great phenotypic diversity even within a species. And that is not normally appreciated when one compares different species. There is already a lot of experiments of nature, if you wish, amongst one species. And the human species, of course, is the best studied species in that regard. Perhaps mice come a little uh, uh, later, but humans are... In the, in the, in, at least in, in, uh, in, in the Western world, are extremely well phenotyped and analyzed in terms of their uh, uh, phenotypes when they, are, so when they succumb to disease. So we know a lot about the human species and that can be a very nice guide to study all these other animals. And of course there is unique physiology. Because when you consider, for example, sharks, they have a completely different uh, mechanism of, uh, of regulating the uh, osmotic pressure in their bodies compared to, say, other fishes or even compared to land-living mammals. And they inhabit different uh, niches and habitats, so they must have adapted their systems to uh, these particular circumstances. There are some fish that only live for a couple of weeks or fish that are so small, or even frogs that are so small, that you can really worry and wonder why they actually bother with uh, develop, uh, developing an adaptive immune system. Maybe they've done away with it because it's not worth it. They are so, they're only very, very tiny organisms. They live for a very short time. Maybe they don't need to invest all that time and energy to build these adaptive immune systems. All that <coughs> suffices to say it is interesting although we do not know where it leads to, it is interesting to use this comparative approach to try to, to uh, carve out these general principles. Of course, one has to, has to decide at what level one would like to work, if at the level of species, so that comparing individuals, or at, across species, or across clades, which features to concentrate on. And then, as I said, ideally, one would like to verify what one has abstracted from these studies through reconstruction, that is from analysis to synthesis. And I'll give you a couple of examples of our journey that uh, tries to understand thymopiesis. And this group of people that I'm blessed with, uh, a photograph taken at a recent retreat in Switzerland, um, we, have take, we have given ourselves the impossible task, and I stress impossible task, to understand the genetic basis of this complicated process. And thymopiesis is meant to mean the organization and development of a particular lymphoid organ, that is the thymus, and to understand what the, this organ does during the lifetime of a vertebrate, that is attract lymphoid progenitors, as you've just heard, educate them to become mature and functional T cells, and then send them to the periphery. So we will never be able to achieve this goal, but we set ourselves this goal so we can continue working every day, seven days a week. Now, what do we do? We use several types of animals for our analysis. So mammals, in mammals we can do genetics and we can do reconstruction because mammals, particularly the mouse, is amenable to genetic manipulation in very fancy ways. So we can do a lot, we can take out genes, we can bring back in genes, we can replace genes, we can modify their expression or their function. So we have all possibilities of very fine, detailed genetic manipulation. So that is our prime model. We analyze from time to time birds, reptiles and amphibians. We also do genetics on teleosts, particularly the zebrafish, and I'll show you a couple of examples later. And this is particularly useful because they are small and relatively cheap to keep. We can even do genetic screens, forward genetic screens, where we screen for particular phenotypes and ask which genes are important to um, uh, modify this particular phenotype. Then the cartilaginous fishes are only subject to analysis because we cannot do any genetics on them. And the same is also true for the jawless vertebrates, of which we particularly focus on lamprey, although I have to say that is also now beginning to move into the teleosts here. We are now exploring the possibility of, of uh, also mutagenizing these fish. They have, a, they have a, a generation time of about 10 years, so one cannot do proper genetics. Um, 
But we can try to um, build or explore systems whereby we do F0 genetics, as I might call it, that is a very efficient mutagenesis procedure whereby we can generate biallelic mutations in genes and thereby then analyze in the F0 generation when most of the cells in a body have the mutated uh, situation then see what the phenotype might be. So there is new developments that we always try to emulate and then see whether we can analyze this different at these different levels of the vertebrate evolution to arrive at this general idea. Now the thymus as you heard is the site of T-cell development and it is characterized in the simplest sense by an interaction of hematopoietic and stromal cells. So the stromal cells provide all the information to attract these progenitor cells and educate them, as you've heard, and send them to the periphery. And that is meant by this particular uh, arrows here. The precursor move into the thymic microenvironment or stroma or rudiment, and then the mature cells leave the thymus. And all these complicated processes that I will briefly touch upon that happen in here, of course, are subject to study by a great number of great scientists. So the thymus, this is a picture of a mouse thymus here, uh, is situated above the heart in the thorax, and you can see this whitish tissue. This is simply because the epithelial cells that are marked here in green are uh, uh, filled with lymphocytes marked in red here, and these lymphocytes, of course, come in and then develop proliferate, as you've just heard, and go through all these selection processes. And operationally, we can divide this into various steps, and we are trying to reconstruct them, or rather understand them genetically, one by one, and we move from left to right. So we would like to understand what the homing process is, we would like to understand what specification is all about, what drives positive, negative selection, what drives egress of these mature T cells from the thymus. And most importantly, of course, we would like to study the thymic microenvironment. And that is very difficult to study because you can only study this in vivo. Whereas it is possible to take out T cells at various stages of development and study them in the test tube. And that is why T cells or T cell development is so well uh, known, studying the thymic microenvironment, that is the stromal compartment, is very difficult indeed. Whenever you take these epithelial cells out of the body and put them into tissue culture, you can see them degenerating and de-differentiating and they're no longer their usual self. They do not correspond to what one sees in vivo. So all the experiments I will be telling you about have the problem that we have to do them in vivo. And that of course takes time, is very costly and uh, impedes rapid progress. But nonetheless, it is of course interesting because it is a situation that is close to the normal situation, so it might give us some extra information that the test tube experiment might not give us. To give you an idea what thymopoiesis is all about. Thymopoiesis is the development of the rudiment, the stroma, and the development of T cells, all together in this one organ. This is what we call thymopoiesis. I show you an experiment that Isabel Hess, a postdoctoral fellow in the lab, has done and published recently, where she has created triple transgenic zebrafish. The reason why she's done this with zebrafish is that during zebrafish development, in the third day after fertilization, thymus development already begins. That is, the rudiment forms, and the rudiment is colonized by the first lymphoid progenitors. And that all can be visualized in, uh, under the microscope. So you can put these larvae under, or embryos under the microscope and absorb them for 24 or 48 hours. And you can actually watch what each cell does as the embryo develops. And she has made them triple transgenic in order to mark the different and important tissue types for our experiment in different colors. The thymic epithelial cells in red, the endothelium of the vasculature in, in blue, and the hematopoietic cells in green. Now, before I show you a movie, which caused this uh, presentation to crash, so I'll have to do a detour, I'll show, I'll show you some some still photographs. So 57.5 hours after, the, after fertilization, the first thymic epithelial cells form in the third pharyngeal pouch of the developing embryo. 
So that is in the very early stages of the third day after fertilization. The development of zebrafish is very rapid, which is good for this particular experiment. One hour later, you can see this is now counting, this is now our starting point, also for the movie that you will see later. Now an hour later, you see the first pioneer lymphocyte approaching the rudiment. And it is very polarized. And the reason why it's polarized is because the thymic rudiment emanates chemotactic signals to which these precursors respond. So they migrate out of the vasculature through the, uh, the tissue and en route directly to the thymic rudiment. Now, two hours later, this first pioneer lymphocyte has already reached the thymic epithelium and made contact. And this is, of course, what thymopoiesis is all about. The cells must receive signals. You've heard about the notch-delta interaction that causes them to become T-cells, and I'll show you some other experiments later. So that requires cell contact. What also requires cell contact is, of course, when the cells make their T-cell receptor, and the specificity of the T-cell receptor must be tested against peptide MHC complexes. So cell cellular interaction is very important. And you can see that the, the companion of this pioneer lymphocyte is already on, on its heels, approaching the rudiment, and then nine hours later, a whole lot of these lymphocytes come. And you will see in the movie that this process is extremely dynamic. So it's not like we always believe that the cells come, settle, and interact with, T -cell, uh, with the epithelium, and that's about it. They sometimes even go out of the thymus again and come back again. So this is a statistical process that we are observing in our uh, static analysis. When you look at the video, it's very dynamic. So I'll have to now exit this for just one second. Okay, so what you see here is now the beginning of this, uh, of this uh, observation period. You see in blue the vasculature. You see a couple of embryonic macrophages that are in light green. And you will see them moving about. And what you will notice that at this, in this area here, sandwiched between these different types of vessels, that will be the development of the thymic rudiment. And this will appear red as time goes by. So I hope we'll see this in these light conditions. So there is a little bit of red. And here, see, this is the first lymphocyte. It divides, and now it... You see how dynamic that is, how these cells touch the epithelium, go out again, in, out, in, out. And we can, of course, quantify and measure this. And by the time the rudiment grows, and while the rudiment grows, more and more cells are coming. And you can observe that for even longer periods of time, and then you see how the thymus as a structure then differentiates and assumes a cortical and medullary regions. So that is a very nice system because the development is so early, now you can interfere genetically with this process. I'm not showing you any experiments, but you can imagine that if you now inject, for example, antisense oligonucleotides that block the translation of certain messenger RNAs, you can then test whether one or the other gene or many genes in combination affect one or the other of this process. For example, the, migra the egress from the, from the vasculature or the migration towards the, to the, the rudiment and so forth. So there's many possibilities. Now, we go back here. So we skipped our, vi our video. Now, how is the thymic epithelial microenvironment formed? Um, ma many years ago, a, a postdoctoral fellow in the laboratory, Michael Niels, uh, worked with me to identify uh, or clarify the, the genetic basis of a, a very important mouse mutation that is the newt mutation that uh, Professor Fischer alluded to. And this newt mutation was discovered as a spontaneous mutation in the 1960s, and it was very useful because it caused thymic dysplasia or aplasia. And no T cells developed, and this could be used for transplantation experiment, it experiments. And it was very important even in cancer research because human tumors could be transplanted into these mice and tested for sensitivity towards certain chemotherapeutic agents. So this is what it looks like when you look at the thymus or the thymic rudiment of a, a newt mouse. 
Now that the gene that is mutated in these, in these animals is called FOXN1, is a transcription factor, and when this gene is no longer functional, then the epithelium is not differentiating. And it's not differentiating properly, it cannot attract any progenitors, and intrathymic T cell development does not occur. That means they have no mature T cells, or at least those T cells that normally develop in the thymic rudiment. This is the control. You've seen this picture before, a well-developed thymus and lots of T-cells inside the epithelium making contacts and receiving instructions. So that was our starting point because it turned out that this gene is very important in directing a plethora of, of downstream events that eventually give rise to a fully functional thymic epithelium or microenvironment. And then a little later, Konrad Bloil, again a postdoctoral fellow in the laboratory, then decided to test whether FOXN1 is really important and once returned to a dysfunctional epithelium can somehow restart the process of thymopoiesis. Because there was a long discussion, which I don't have time to explain to you, whether thymus development can only occur during embryogenesis and then once it has failed there, cannot restart in later life. And that is an important problem, of course, when one considers perhaps therapeutic aspects of the system. So what he managed to do, he, he established a conditional genetic system whereby he could reactivate FOXN1 in single cells of a rudiment where all the other cells were still dysfunctional for FOXN1. So only one cell in this particular case, this blue cell marked here, is resupplied with the functional FOXN1 gene. This is through some uh, clever genetic trick. And what happens then is that this particular epithelial stem cell differentiates into what we call a thymic developmental unit. That is a cortical and a medullary area. It's a very small thymic tissue. And we can estimate that the normal thymus is made up of about two to three hundred of such uh, uh, units that coalesce later and build one large and cortex and one large medulla. But one epithelial cell gives rise to a certain size of a fully functional uh, uh, thymopoietic tissue. And that showed that this epithelium has self-organizing properties in a sense. In the way it differentiates into these different types, and I'll show you a scheme in a moment, it can attract these lymphocyte progenitors and build a thymus tissue that is fully functional. And that is of course very important. This self-organizing capacity can then be harnessed perhaps later when we build artificial thymic tissues, and I'll come to this in a moment. Now, the conclusion from this was, although it was only done per experiment in mammals, when looking at the histology of the thymus in sharks and mammals, so spanning the entire 400 million years of jaw vertebrate evolution, it seemed that this epithelial stem cell would, through some intermediates, give rise to cortical and medullary epithelial cells, and you've heard how they function during positive and negative selection and are very important in the education process of T cells. And we felt that this, these stem cells, of which there are a few hundreds uh, um, uh, in, in the thymus, so a very minor population of cells, that they have self-organizing properties because once they are set in motion, this is a cell, cell intrinsic process that then gives rise to the thymic microenvironment. Now, I, in the very beginning, I said that there is a second sister group of vertebrates, that is the jawless vertebrates, very primitive vertebrates, and presumably originating about 500 million years ago, and it was a long debate as to whether these jawless vertebrates also have a thymus. And we've, we've labored uh, um, without much success for this, on, the, on this problem for many years, and a major advance was possible on our end through the work of uh, the, the, the laboratory of Max Cooper, who had discovered that these lamprey animals have indeed many different types of lymphocytes, not only B-like lymphocytes but also T-like lymphocytes. And that gave us the possibility to then reinvestigate the question of whether lamprey have a thymus. When I was writing the paper I was going through the old literature and the literature you can even start reading about this in the middle of the 19th century. And then, of course, you have to go back to the, uh, the volumes of uh, learned societies in Vienna, 
in London, uh, even in Paris, where scientists have discussed at length and in detail whether or not these creatures have a thymic tissue. And there was, of course, votes for and votes against, but they could not recognize what we now think is the thymus equivalent in, uh, in lamprey. And I will show you what that is. Now, the discovery of different lymphocyte lineages in, in, in jawless vertebrates by the Cooper Laboratory is a kind of déjà vu because Max had, in the 1960s, discovered a dichotomy of B and T cell lineages in jaw vertebrates. And 50 years later or 45 years later, he's done the same for the jawless vertebrates. That, of course, means that there is a certain element of symmetry, and that alludes to my title. The, the general design principles that we have, not only a dichotomy of lymphocyte lineages of B, and T-like cells in these two different groups of jaw vertebrates, but there is also this two types of T-cell lineages, the alpha, beta, and gamma, delta, as we know them, or because lamprey have different types of receptors called VLRA and VLRC, also two different types of T-cells. We do not know whether they have a second type of B-cell lineages. We certainly do, and genetically that can be distinguished in teleos, not so easily in mammals. But there is this certain symmetry here, which would indicate to us that all vertebrates have these types of lymphocytes. They have B-like lymphocytes and they have T-like lymphocytes. And if they have all T-like lymphocytes, it was very simple, a very simple conclusion that they might also have an organ where these T-cells develop. And you can even make inferences about the common vertebrate ancestor. This presumably had these two types of lineages. Maybe they were coming from an original ur B cell or ur T cell and all that originating from some ur lymphocyte. But there is no animal that we have found or scientists have found that would represent this situation. It goes from nothing seemingly of all extant animals, for example, chordates, amphioxus, to this situation. So there's a lot missing of intermediate stages or presumed intermediate stages in the, in the fossil record. Now when we looked at lamprey larvae, and this is the, 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 the front part of a lamprey larvae, you see these gill slits here. When you do sections, this is perhaps a little difficult to see, but then you see the gill basket, the structures that are characteristic for the lamprey uh, pharynx. And at the tip of this gill basket, we detected expression of a gene by the name of CDA1, which is a cytidine deaminase 1, which is implicated in the formation of mature lymphocyte receptors that these lamprey possesses. So lampreys do not use RAG to assemble their T cell receptor or immunoglobulin genes. They use cytidine deaminases but, and, and a gene conversion-like process to build mature uh, receptor genes. I don't have time to discuss that today, but I'll allude briefly to it a little later. So, and this CDA1 gene is the one that was presumed to be associated with the development of these receptors in the T-like cells in lamprey. So we use that basically as a marker. As you would and possibly could use RAG1 expression that you heard about earlier, as a marker of a site where lymphocytes in jaw vertebrates develop. So, for example, in the, in, in, the, in the bone marrow or in the thymus. Now, continuing the collaboration with the Cooper Laboratory, we used electron microscopy to look at these particular regions where this, the expression of this gene was found. And alas, we found a, a situation that looked very similar to the situation that we find in the thymus of jaw vertebrates. That is an interdigitating uh, interaction between lymphocytes and epithelial cells, very much what you would expect for a tissue that directs the uh, uh, formation and selection of lymphocytes. And you can go even further and find, when you look at the, these lymphocytes here and look at the status of their uh, VLR genes, that is the genes that make up their antigen receptors, you find all sorts of intermediates in the very same as you would find intermediates when you look at RAG-mediated VDJ recombination, where all these different bits and pieces have to be put together to form a proper T cell receptor or immunoglobulin. They do the same. They use different types of modules. They put them together, and you can see that in this particular region, we can isolate all these half-finished intermediate stages of 
these particular receptors. Again, giving us an indication that perhaps this is the region where these lymphocytes are developing and as a part of that development they are creating and building their mature antigen receptors. We do not know much more because we cannot do many experiments that we're used to be doing, for example in mammals, we cannot do transplantation of thymic tissue there, we cannot do anything else, but we have had recent success um, um, Norimasa Ivanami, a, a senior a project leader in, in, in my department, has managed to create um, a genetic lesions in these particular loci through the, the use of, um, of the, the, the CRISPR-mediated mutagenesis system, and we're now eagerly awaiting the analysis of the phenotypes of these F0 animals. As I said, we cannot do proper crossings with these because of their long generation time. But there is now a chance to actually interrogate functionally the, the function of these particular genes. The end of that, or the conclusion, is that lamprey also have a thymus. So when you look at this now, it seems quite amazing that we have all these different types of tissues, thymus, spleen, or the bone marrow equivalent, which in, in fish often is the kidney, um, or gut-associated lymphoid tissue. All of this is found in all vertebrates. So that is a major innovation of hematopoietic and immune systems that characterizes the vertebrate group of animals on, on this planet. The only major new innovation in morphological terms, and then of course with the associated functional changes, are lymph nodes. And lymph nodes arise at a time, maybe 250 million years ago, at the transition from reptiles and birds. And there is debate as to where exactly that might have happened, because different species in these groups have different types of proto-lymph lymph nodes. Uh, you might call them. So there is, some, there is a, a, a major new innovation and it's certainly clear that mammal, all mammals have lymph nodes and that perhaps has to do with their uh, new way of reproduction and I don't have time to discuss that but of course that must have had major and major impact on immune systems that you all of a sudden develop the so-called placental lifestyle. Now if we summarize this and I showed you part of that picture before. So here we have our mammalian situation, the common epithelial stem cell, and then these cortical areas that all come together. And when you look at this, this thymic epithelial developmental unit, this is what happens in mammals. They all coalesce these regions to form these big medullas and big cortical regions, whereas in the lamprey where they sit on the tips of the gill filaments, presumably through embryological constraints, they remain dispersed and then occupy a bit like hats on these filaments, these various filaments. So here they are, they, they remain dispersed, this is at least the interpretation, and each of which arising from this single epithelial stem cell, and here they are coalescing. Now, what determines a thymopoietic environment? What makes a thymus so special? If all vertebrates have a thymus to allow development of T-cells, this must be really something unique that you will not find anywhere else in the body. So there must be a reason for all of this. So it should be possible, now again using this comparative approach, to identify the key molecules that define a thymopoietic microenvironment. Now, Barbak Bajokli, some years ago, used a very complicated and extensive phylogenetic analysis of genomes and genes and expression profiling and whatever to derive a, 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 a list of candidates that this FOXN1 transcription factor that I already mentioned before, that is the key regulator of thymic epithelial differentiation, has presumably regulated in various stages of vertebrate evolution. And he concluded that one of the first targets of this FOXN1 transcription factor was delta-like 4 or its equivalent in other species. And delta-like 4, as you've just heard, is the key notch ligand that gives a lymphocyte progenitor the signal to become a T cell. So that is a very important target, direct target of FOXN1. What is also a very important target of FOXN1 is CXCL12, which is a chemokine that is capable of attracting hematopoietic progenitors to a particular site. Another chemokine, CCL25, the receptor for this is CCR9, you heard about this before. CCL21, 
The receptor is CCR7, also uh, mentioned before, and kit ligand, or stem cell factor, also a target of FOXM1. And indirectly, although I'm not discussing this today, FOXM1 also controls MHC expression in the thymic epithelium, particularly MHC class 2, through its regulation of C2TA, which is central regulator of MHC class 2 expression. So FOXM1 really is, although I don't like the term very much, a master regulator of a genetic program that equips thymic epithelial cells with all the facilities to attract and specify and perhaps select incoming uh, lymphocyte progenitors. Now, if this is really true, is it possible to reconstitute, let's say, a primitive uh, thymic microenvironment by using just a handful of these factors? And we are not interested now in, in recapitulating a quantitative thymic environment, that is, producing millions, millions of T-cells. We are interested in the qualitative aspect. So what is really required, minimally, to make a thymoepoetic environment? Now, Leslie Calderon, one of the few students in the lab, then decided to take on that task, and she generated, now transgenically, different types of thymic epithelial cells. They were all FOXN1 deficient, and as you've seen before, they are functionally inadequate. They cannot do anything. Now she transgenically fortified this, this functional ground state, as she called it, with delta-like 4, the notch ligand, CXL12, the chemokine, CCL25, the chemokine, or the kit ligand SCF. Singly or in all possible combinations. So you can calculate quickly that's more than a dozen different combinations. And then she analyzed what is actually happening in the rudiment. And of course, we were hoping that we would see something, although we were not sure whether these factors alone or in combination would be able to attract progenitors and do something to them. So that is the outcome. I'll give you the key, the key uh, combinations. The first combination that is of, of particular interest is, this is now color-coded, Kit ligand and CCL25, the chemokine and this uh, um, um, stem cell factor. The thymus now produces mast cells. No T cells, no B cells, but mast cells. Indicating that the, this particular combination can attract a type of progenitor cell that then in this particular environment can produce mast cells. That was a very surprising finding because normally the thymus is not a site that is known to produce myeloid-derived cells. Next combination. You add one extra factor, SCF, CSL25, and CXL12. This is now this triple combination. Now the thymus looks like a bone marrow. B-cell development occurs in the thymus. And when you look at this by flow cytometry and analyze the cell surface phenotype of these cells, you can be easily tricked and fooled into believing that this is coming from a bone marrow. Next combination. Now we look at delta-like 4, SCF, and CCL25, this particular combination. Now the thymus is being turned into an environment that supports early T-cell development, but only to the double negative stage. You've seen these complicated series of stages, but now this is only double negative. And of course, the quadruple combination, that now produces T cells up to the double positive stage where the T cells make that T cell receptor at the cell surface. And now what happens, this is what you heard before, now they all die by neglect. Because the epithelium, in the way it was reconstructed here, does not express MHC. And when there is no MHC expression, these T cells, or rather the T cell receptor, don't see their ligand, they don't receive a survival signal and they all die. So that, of course, is uh, impeding further analysis, but at least it showed that these four factors could produce a minimal thymopoietic environment to a very important uh, uh, stage of development, that is, when the T-cell receptor comes to the cell surface. Indicating also that the, the lymphocytes, when they come here and get the delta or the notch signal, this is a cell autonomous event. They don't need much else to progress to this particular stage. And when one analyzes all these possible combinations, it's clear that these factors synergize. 
So not, each factor does not work alone, but it depends on the context. Different combinations produce different outcomes, and there's a hierarchy. Delta like 4 is the, at the top of the hierarchy. When there is a notch signaled cell, there is nothing else happening but T cell development. So delta like 4 is very important, and that reminds you of the analysis I mentioned that Baobab Bajogli did, where he found that delta like 4 is the first target of this particular Foxin 1 gene. But the story is a little more exciting. This is now a flow cytometry analysis of these quadruple transgenics on the Foxin 1 minus minus background that I showed you in the scheme. Here are the double positive cells, here are the double negatives. So this is a typical early stage thymus development. Looks basically like a wild type. But what, uh, what Leslie Calderon found is that you only need two factors, CXCL12 and delta like 4 to produce the same thing. Not in terms of numbers, but in qualitative terms. These are also T cell receptor beta positive and they can be taken out and differentiated fully in a, in a normal environment. And that is what now makes sense. When you look at the, the analysis of, of, of Baubach, where he looked at FOXN1-like genes, delta-like genes, CXCL12, this chemokine, the notch being the receptor for this one and the CXCL4 being the receptor for that one, here's always a plus, so that all makes sense, and we presume the common ancestor already had that. What the uh, amphioxus does not have is the chemokines, but it has delta-like functions. And what is important here, CCR9, which was presumed to be an important attractor and is not found in lamprey, which confused everybody for a time, has now, this problem I think has now been laid to rest because we know that CXL12 in itself qualitatively is, is uh, uh, required or is, is sufficient to bring these lymphocyte progenitors. So what is our conclusion? In mice and perhaps in all vertebrates, these two factors suffice to attract these progenitors. They generate double positive thymocytes. Of course, this is the wrong name for a lamprey lymphocyte because they do not have CD4 and CD8, but it's the stage where they first bring their receptor to the surface and it suppresses B cell development. Quite a surprising finding um, that we felt then encouraged to ask an even bolder question. Can we now, and this is a bit of fantasy now, can we now perhaps reconstruct the primordial thymic environment? So when it all began, so this is what I mean by this. So we know when we look in the, in the, in the lamprey, in the thymus, this is now the lymphopoietic capacity of the thymus, this is only T cells. When we look at mammals, only T cells. There are a few B cells in there, but they are not generated there, they are just living there. But this is T-cell poiesis, T-cell poiesis here. It was known from the literature that in lower vertebrates, like in teleosts or in sharks, there is a substantially higher proportion of B-cells, and there was always debate as to whether these B-cells are actually generated there or whether they simply make up a, a larger fraction of lymphocytes in the thymus. This is all observable. If we had all the means, we could establish this very nicely, but here is now the fantasy. This is this uh, dotted area. This is now the hypothetical thymic primordium. We know that in Amphioxus there is no thymus because they don't have lymphocytes and we could not detect anything that approaches the thymus. So at some stage intermediate between this and the early vertebrate ancestor there must have been something happening that built a thymopoietic microenvironment. So is it possible for us to recreate this? This is now this is schematic, and I will use this for quite, some, uh, quite often now. This is evolutionary time, so 600 million years ago to the present. Now, I've told you about the function, or the crucial function of FOXN1. FOXN1 is a crucial regulator of, the, of this particular process in regulating the specificity and function of the thymic epithelium. And interestingly enough, coming from Bajogli's work, we knew that FOXN1 is a paralog of an ancient gene by the name of FOXN4 that still exists in our genome. But this gene arose by gene duplication at the base of the vertebrate evolution. 
So all of a sudden we have two genes. And FOXN1, we know, is the key regulator in this, in this particular group of species. But what about <coughs> regulation in lower vertebrates? Is FOXN1 equally important here? So essentially what we wanted to do is we wanted to create a nude fish that does not have, of course they don't have hair, so it would be, but it was just interesting to see. But of course, as always, the best laid plans usually fail. So when we then, by, by collaborating with a colleague in, uh, at, at uh, uh, Kyoto, um, uh, Shonichi Takeda, we, we found from a pool of uh, uh, chemically mutagenized fish, we found two alleles of FOXN1 that uh, encoded non-functional uh, forms of this transcription factor. And then we analyzed T cell development in these mutant fish. And initially it looked really good because we are assaying it here, I hope we can see this, we are assaying it here with RAG expression like we often do when we look for thymopoietic tissues. And there was nothing in these mutants. Unfortunately, at the time, disappointingly, there was RAG expression at later stages of development, relatively rapidly catching up here. And that persists into later stages. They can make T cells. The diversity is not as high. It almost looks like a hypoplastic thymus, but it's functionally equivalent to the normal thymus, just doesn't make so many, B, so many T cells. But when they live normally, so they have absolutely no problem. So then we had, we had really had a problem. FOXN1 does, or mutation of FOXN1 does not block T cell development in lower vertebrates. So that caused a bit of an uh, irritation. Then when we looked at expression of FOXN4, now at a stage where there is no FOXN1, so before the duplication, we found, and then, then of course the, the spirit was a bit higher, we found that the expression of this gene amongst many other places is also in the pharyngeal endoderm. And the pharyngeal endoderm is the origin of the thymic epithelium in all jawed vertebrates. And we thought, aha, perhaps there is an expression of FOXN1 and FOXN4 in these lower vertebrates also in the thymic epithelium, and perhaps that could compensate for the loss of FOXN1. So now we look at the gene expression, and this is now the amphioxo situation, and we imagine that when this develops further during evolution, this remains the same until this duplication occurs. And often when genes duplicate, initially at least, paralogous genes are expressed in the same expression domains, or at least partly. So we assume that at this stage, FOXN1 was also expressed at where FOXN4 was expressed. And maybe that continued in these lower vertebrates, and this is why loss of FOXN1 could be compensated by FOXN4. And that is indeed true. I'm not showing you the data. What I showed you here as expression profiles is in, in fact correct. And we can show that FOXN1 and FOXN4, particularly in zebrafish, where we have all the tools to isolate the cells, are co-expressed in the same cells. So that raised the possibility that perhaps FOXN4 has thymopoietic activity. And the experiment to do, of course, is very simple. You take a mouse, you eliminate FOXN1, and you replace FOXN1 either by FOXN1 as a control, or you put in FOXN4 and see what happens. And this is what happens. This is the FOXN1 deficient rudiment. Nothing, ha sorry, nothing happens. This is the control. Then is our transgenic replacement. Now we, on this background, we bring back FOXN1. Looks perfectly normal. And this is the big surprise. Bring in FOXN4, looks not bad. This is the thymic <coughs> histology, medulla cortex. This is not quite right. The experts will easily see this. There's some degenerated parts, cystic structures. That, is, of course, is a sign of a near normal or not properly developed thymus. But in terms of T cell development, it's not bad at all. And the periphery is colonized by these T cells. They are functionally uh, 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 normal. There is no autoimmunity. They can respond to immunization and so forth. So that's, this is perfectly fine. Thymopoietic activity is rescued by this ancient gene, which is a big surprise. But what you can, will also notice that the fraction of double negative cells is relatively high compared to the normal situation here. And we found, and I think I'm going a bit faster now so that I can finish, we found that 
FOXM4 expression causes B cell development alongside T cell development in the thymus. So it's no longer T centric. It has T cells, it makes T cells as I showed you, but it also supports B cell development. And B cell development in a manner that is equivalent to the bone marrow. And what is the most interesting uh, part of this experiment, this is now uh, looking at double positive cells, double negative cells, number of B cells. We restrict ourselves to this now for the moment. So in the, in the wild type situation where we bring in only FOXN1, or the, the equivalent of wild type, there is very few B cells, a few thousand. You have a couple of million B cells when you co-express FOXN1 and FOXN4, and this is the fish situation, as it were. And when you go to FOXN4 only, you still have a lot of B cells, but substantially less in numbers. So this is now recapitulating the fish thymus situation. Lots of B cells, lots of T cells. Of course, T cells are much, uh, much uh, more frequent, but nonetheless, there's a, lot, there's a lot of B cells there. So that recapitulates what we've seen in the expression profile, FOXN1, FOXN4 co-expressed, and that causes B cells to develop. And when we take away FOXN1 and only have FOXN4, still B cells, but much, much fewer T cells. So that would indicate that there is a shift in T or B centricity during evolution, as I explained to you in this first uh, picture, in this one here. So lots of B cells in the beginning and very little B cells at the end of this developmental or this evolutionary trajectory. So what about this here? We think that this is, was driven by FOXN4, lots of B cells, but also T cells. Now we have the opportunity by reconstructing this in, in, an, extern, in an extern animal that is in mouse. Of course, this no longer lives, so we cannot study this. But we can create the genetic situation. Now we can study the phenotype. And we are using the, 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 the knowledge that lymphocytes are a very ancient component in the system. I told you, lamprey and jaw vertebrates, they all have T cells, they all have B cells, they have different types of T and B cells. So we can simply take the thymopoietic environment into the, of, of an ancient type into a modern animal because we presume that the lymphocytes are sort of equivalent. Of course, that is not perfect, but it's the best we can do. And then simply see what happens. And the surprise came when we looked at the histology of these thymi. And the key, the key picture is here. So when you look at CD8 cells as a, as a marker of T cells, you will find that they are, and this K8 is a marker for epithelium, they sit in the cortex and the med, in the medulla in the epithelial environment. That this is quite typical and this is normal. They need to interact with the epithelium to be educated and specified. Now the B cells here marked with B220, they sit in a completely different place. They sit in the perivascular space. Now the perivascular space, you must know, is a mesenchymal compartment in the thymus. It ensheathes the vessels and normally is not visible as a compartment because it's, it's essentially on top of the vessels and separates the vessels, the endothelium of the vessels and all this, uh, these structures from the epithelium in, in the thymus. But here the the, um, this, this here is the wild type, you can see that, so the, the, uh, the, uh, the mesenchymal compartment of the perivascular area is now in green, and you see no red cells, the, the few B cells that you have there are scattered all over the place, but in the reconstructed primordial situation you have these B cells sitting in the perivascular space, here is the blow up. And the perivascular space with its, with its uh, mesenchymal environment is exactly what you see in a sinus in the bone marrow. So that is essentially now creating what we think or interpret to be a chimeric organ that has an epithelial compartment that's, that supports T cell development and a special perivascular compartment that supports B cell development. So the expression of this ancient factor now generates a developmental segregation where T cells and B cells are separate in the same organ and develop happily alongside. And this is our scheme and we've done more experiments to show that the key difference between FOXN1 and FOXN4 is 
is the regulation of the delta like 4 ligand. Foxn4 cannot produce so much delta like 4 than Foxn1 does. And because uh, IL7, which is also produced in the, in the thymus, is not dependent on Foxn1, the ratio between IL7 and delta like 4 changes. And because the perivascular space have, has lots of FLT3 ligand, the ratio of, of delta like 4 signal capacity versus FLT3 ligand and IL7, which are B cell promoting conditions, changes from FOXN1 to FOXN4 to the extent that the perivascular space now is conducive to supporting B cell development because there is a supply of FLT3 ligand and IL7 and there is not enough delta like 4. Why is this? I showed you, this was on purpose, in the very beginning, this very dynamic behavior of cells when they enter the thymus. It's not that they come through the vessels and enter the epithelium and remain there. This is not true. They come and they make contact and they have a certain level and a certain number of contacts on the, on, through their notch receptor and they presumably accumulate signals by making many, many contacts and that, these contacts, of course, are governed by the density of the delta-4 delta like ligand in the epithelium. So when they come in, touch, go out, come in, go out, come in, go out, come in. They accumulate far fewer notch signals in this particular situation than they do here. And then they might eventually decide to settle here. And once they've started their B-cell program through the combined action of lit 3 ligand and IL-7, they are no longer interested in becoming T-cells because they then start developing here and will never see delta like 4. The ones that make it and accumulate enough delta like 4 signals through their notch receptor, they remain in the epithelium and they become T-cells. So this is our interpretation at least, and we can do more experiments, we've done more experiments to show this by manipulating the ratio of this here and we produce the, the, the expected outcome. So the ratio of this ancient factor and this uh, IL-7 general lymphopoietic factor determines the ratio of B and T cell development in this particular tissue. So that would suggest to us that at least we have now the, the glimpse of the genetic factors that regulate homing and specification. And we have to stop here for the moment. And now we are beginning to build more in our, uh, in our minimalistic systems to reproduce now these next steps, that is positive selection and negative selection. And we already have mice that express um, MHC. And we will see now what other factors we need to push these cells from this double positive stage into this positive selection stage. Of course, we will never reach this end here, but we, we will keep trying. Now, a very important slide at the end is the collaborator slide. So we enjoy a very productive and very fruitful collaboration with the uh, uh, laboratory of Max Cooper, now at Emory University. We work together with Parappa Venkatesh on the shark immune system. He's at the IMCB in Singapore. With Amphioxus is being worked on together with Nick Holland at uh, Scripps. And our, our fish mutants for Fox and One were done together with uh, Shunichi Takeda at Kyoto University. And I should also mention the two people that are still in the laboratory and work with me on these projects. The other names I've mentioned. Uh, but they have since left the lab. This is Isabel Hess here and, and Jeremy Swan. And I thank you for your attention.